thank you all uh, for sure, sticking around sorry. at the very tail end of, uh, of this long uh, conference here. Uh, my name is Ryan LaFollette. I'm one of the eight PDs at uh, the University of Cincinnati um, and am humbled to be amongst these great educators uh, here who have a wealth of experience. So really the um, ideology of this lecture came from when I signed on as APD at the University of Cincinnati, they said, electives, here you go. And I uh, had to essentially revamp the program with uh, a new look at accountability and, uh, and diversity, and it created a lot of uh, perspective for me uh, and a lot of curiosity as to how other programs, other institutions approached electives. And so that's how we all came together uh, and have been learning a lot from each other. And uh, hopefully uh, we'll be able to discuss some good topics, both things that you can consider in your program as well as your administration uh, as, as you continue to have, kind of evolve your own electives. So um, we have, oh, do you want to? I can do uh, So before we do that, um, uh, Dr. Gallagher is going to talk briefly about um, just kind of what the overall vision and how we got elective so integral into emergency medicine in, in the first place. So, I mean, all of you know that we're sort of a younger specialty, right? And so, um, you know, the history of EM was interesting, right? It started out as one person with a one-year, uh, you know, residency plan, and that person got approved, and it wasn't ACGME accredited. And then in 1985, it's sort of like it had been sort of more established as two years. And electives weren't really part of that. And then in 1985, it morphed to, to, to a three-year standard. So that there was a standard curriculum for a three-year process. And, and again, electives is not a requirement in ACGME. But as we've sort of developed and we've matured and we've become more sophisticated in emergency medicine and we have programs that have three years and four years, and there's, you know, you can debate ad nauseum about what that means, but really all of us are working to produce clinicians, but we want to produce clinicians that are going to be in practice for 20, 30 years. We want to help them develop themselves in really thoughtful ways. And so many of us have this elective time, and depending on how you craft the concept of that elective time, it's really important. Um, so as we start to think about where do we want our specialty to go, where do we want our folks to go, because back then it was like everybody trained in emergency medicine and you basically went to emergency medicine and there was a handful of you know, fellowships maybe. But you didn't prepare yourself for a fellowship, you sort of dropped yourself into a fellowship. And now we have this whole host of fellows. Our, our specialty has grown in its thoughtfulness as far as all the specialties that our folks can go into and part of our job when we talk about UME to GME transition, and I think about a GME to GME transition too, is what do we, how do we tell people to think about the next step in their career? And this opportunities, we have crafted our elective time into pathways in order to help residents explore the opportunities that might be available to them in their future career. So that's, that's sort of the brief history and the sort of the vision of what we're talking about when we talk about elective engineering. So our overall objectives are gonna be, we're gonna describe kind of, our, or contextualize our models uh, independently, which vary quite a bit. Um, uh, understand some of the administrative uh, strengths and pitfalls of various elective models, um, and really include that in both the kind of track-based or terminal process, as well as the unstructured elective time, uh, both of which uh, almost all of our programs have, and then exploring the uh, advantages and disadvantages of elective timing and really talking about some of the limitations, uh, the pearls and pitfalls, uh, if you will. Um, so we come from a variety of institutions uh, here and we were going to uh, go through what each of those programs look like, but then it just got lost in the details. So if, uh, if you were interested in the differences between our programs and how we have them structured, um, that QR code will take you to a separate PowerPoint, um, which will show us what our individual programs uh, offer. So I'll leave that up for a second while you guys sit. Awesome. 
Um, so I think uh, the first topic that we really want to talk about is an elective is only as good as your mentor that you have running that elective. Uh, and there's some curation of people uh, as well as some continuation and some trust and some validation in maintaining those mentor relationships. So um, I'll hand it to whoever wants to speak about uh, how they have successfully curated this. So again, I totally agree. If you don't have a good mentor who runs your elective or a good team that runs your elective like EMS or toxicology, then it, the elective just falls flat on, its face, flat on its face. So we like to talk about different types of mentors. And we also talk about lifelong mentors versus like career advice mentors. So it's very important when they're looking at electives is finding that mentor. Is the elective something that they just want an experience, like a life experience? Like I want to go do something austere, or I want to go experience a different environment, or something I never plan on making my career, but I think will add to me as a physician in my, you know, my training. It's more of a lifelong mentor or a life learning type of mentor versus your career mentor, where you actually, like, I actually want to do a really challenging or maybe a critical care type fellowship, and then you want to start talking about what kind of electives you're doing to set you so, yourself up to be a very good candidate for that fellowship. So the mentors are very important in figuring out how to use your elective time. And some residents need like a break, and they, they want to do a wellness elective, and if there's, they meet our goals and they meet our objectives, that's okay. But that's because they are trying to add to themselves as a person. So finding those mentors and what type of electives you're doing is very important because without them to help you create your elective and make it fulfilling, you're wasting your time. And I think for residents, it's very important. Even though residency seems like it's a million years long, it will end, and that time is precious. <laughs> I promise. Yeah, and I would just add, if you don't have these teams in place uh, and people want to go do other kinds of electives, utilize your alumni network. That's a really key place where you can find people that are engaged and want to be a part of your program. They want to give back to the place that trained them. Um, that might be doing really cool, cool things that are not necessarily part of your institution um, that you're based out of. So think about them. Um, realize that you may have to provide a little bit of faculty development for anyone who's going to be mentoring your electives. Uh, we'll talk in a little bit about kind of educational objectives and making sure that's the primary goal. Uh, but you also have to have someone who's going to be able to assess what the residents are doing on their electives. So if you are branching out and kind of looking beyond the, the traditional fellowship teams and things like that, be prepared for a little bit of faculty development, particularly around the assessment features. Um, so we, uh, so I meet with every single resident every year. That is my APD role, and talk about um, what their overall elective plan is going to be. And sometimes that involves a track, and sometimes that does not involve a track. And uh, the, so we have kind of terminal experiences: chief resident, resident assistant, medical directors. Uh, but not everyone falls into that trajectory. I think Hopkins probably has the most uh, defined uh, terminal experience, uh, but just how do you balance that um, desire for a longitudinal involvement that comes with a track with the need for flexibility and or the uh, uh, pluripotent uh, resonant with too many uh, interests to fall into uh, a track? Which never happens. Never happens. So what he's alluding to is something we call our FAST program, which was a beautiful brainchild of the a current program director, Linda Regan. So I can't take credit for this one. But it is the fourth year, I get a very focused year, and we found we had tracks. We found actually, as Dr. Gallagher was saying, you have to be flexible. The residents couldn't drop into one track. And so we began to realize we had to actually create different tracks to accommodate their dreams and their desires. And we finally said, what do you want to do? And we'll actually create the track around you. So when people say, oh, you have to pick one of the five, I actually will tell people, actually, you can pick our 20 we have. You can actually create one. Probably one third of them were created by residents. So that flexibility of meeting their needs and finding the mentors to actually have those tracks and give them that experience was something we worked very hard for. 
and it made it not confined. And I think that was very important. And it's very, very flexible. Some of them do a lot, and some of them just do the bare minimum because they just, you know, they have other things they want to do, and that is okay. It is okay that they, they have different levels of engagement as long as they meet, as we'll talk about in a few seconds, just the bare minimum. They have to have something. Um, but it was a very good experience for us to realize that we had to flex more to them and they had such great ideas and be open to that and not say, nope, you have to pick ultrasound or admin or research and that's it. You know? So it was a great, great project for us and it's also taught us how to create better electives. And along those lines, to talk about pitfalls that I know we've experienced at Vandy, it's, you know, we want our residents to have that freedom and really be adult learners and say, hey, this is, you know, if you're not going to fit into kind of the more traditional role with our selectives and things like that, that's great. You can craft something new, but that has to start early. And so there have been a lot of times where, like, let's sit down and talk about this, and they come up with great ideas. You're like, that's so wonderful. And you're 30 days from your selective, and we have no possible way to set that up. So just as, as we always do, being proactive with that mentorship. That's something we're really trying to build a lot more as well. We're also the only three-year program up here, so it's a slightly different mentality. I know that's why I'm like secluding myself in the corner. <laughs> but it brings, it brings up a great point of like, do you create time at the very junior level to start thinking about being intentional about what you're gonna do with your time? I think everything we do in education has to be around being intentional. And so that's what we're talking about is we actually build out time in our intern year where we basically articulate very clearly this is your time to think about what you are going to craft in your later years so that you can start talking to mentors, you can see who sparks you, you can see kind of like talk to faculty who are doing these things that, you know, you might have five different interests, but you see the person who's your perfect mentor in one of those, that's the perfect time to start thinking and crafting and asking for resources then so that we can have everything in place to support you. So intentionality is really what we're talking about in education and allowing us to really access the residents' needs, goals, and desires so that we are, again, education's about context, right? It's about meeting the learners where they're at, and that's what we're all talking about here. And just one more thing to add on to that. And we are, I think, we're probably all saying this too. When we're talking about mentors, obviously that leans towards fellows and faculty, but I think there's a huge push in using your senior residents as mentors as well and creating that uh, a wonderful dynamic for them to reach out to the interns and really walk them through and speak a language that, I hate to say, as we get older and more removed from it, it becomes a little bit harder for us to do. Oh, I mean um, more experienced. <laughs> Sorry, experienced and seasoned. Eyes. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> particularly uh, with senior uh, residents or critically heavy uh, rotations, it is uh, often viewed as non-clinical and therefore uh, wellness. So uh, the wellness elective uh, does not exist for us because I think uh, it needs to be much more intentional about how it is actually improving your sustainability as an emergency physician, academician, um, whatever you see yourself as, um, rather than uh, wellness as the explicit uh, goal. And so uh, we really harp on wellness on shift and wellness in your life, uh, which rarely in, in your future career involves, you know, weeks uh, at a time uh, pursuing, pursuing those things. So that is how I've decided to address it, but I look forward to how you have. <laughs> So if you're asking what, what do we mean by wellness, and it wasn't, somebody up here said that their resident wanted to go to Costa Rica and surf for a month, and that was an appropriate elective because it contributed to their wellness and their, their, their you know, and all of us started laughing because we think that'd be great. Even as an attending, I don't get to go take a month off and go surfing for a week. It doesn't work, I mean, for a month. It doesn't work that way. But trying to find that balance of an elective or giving them those opportunities to explore what they really want to do, what they love. If you can also do a course, or you go teach a course on venomous snake bites, and you link up with the local EMS system and do some ride-alongs, then we have a really good idea where you are for most of your rotation, and then we're gonna deliver, you're gonna deliver to us either your talk that you did, or a write-up of your experience will have some objectives, and we can talk about you going to Costa Rica, and then you can surf at three o'clock in the afternoon when you're done or in the morning, and then you go to your stuff at noon. 
We can make it work for you, but you're going to have to bring something to it because this is a very precious time, and your wellness is important, but this time is so important for you to also develop as a human and develop as a physician. I think a lot of it has to do with signposting, too. You know, we, a wellness elective does not have to be going and doing yoga all day long, right? But we can say, look, we understand that you're working these crazy hours in the emergency department, and you want a structure elective that maybe gives you some evenings free to be with your spouse or your children. Like that in and of itself is wellness. It doesn't mean that you can't actually do some productive learning and obtain your objectives during the day or whenever you schedule to do it. But it's okay to say this is a little bit more relaxed or this is, this is improving your life in addition to also being educational. And I think that's the key is, you know, you'll get the pushback of, oh, but what about my wellness? Like, great, I, I, I want you to be well, I care about your wellness, and this is how we're going to incorporate it into the elective. But it's wellness, it's not vacation. Right. Although we will add, usually, our week vacation for Rucker and Terrier will be a part of the selective, which is one way we mitigated it. But I, I couldn't agree more, and I think that phrasing is something that going forward is just helpful. Again, you can relax, but those are the goals. So basically, what we want to talk about. And the anti, anti wellness is the, the next topic uh, that we have. <laughs> on here. Um, another, another reason that this came up is a lot of these experiences were hard stopped uh, when COVID happened. Uh, and I think it required a lot of flexibility uh, and a, 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 an impressive rallying of resources um, when there is a break in electives. So um, what did you use uh, and how do you address when electives need to be broken? I think everything in education is about how we pivot. And I think trying to, when we talk about being an intentional and what we're all talking about is when we say like, you can create this, we have goals to meet these needs. Um, for ourselves, right, all of our global health electives were shut down because nobody could guarantee people's safety. And when we talk about what we do as program directors, you know, and sort of like the elements and the foundational elements of what we do, first and foremost is trying to make sure that our people are safe whether that means ensuring that they've got PPE, making sure they're safe in the environment from violence, verbal oppression, coercion, all the things that we really care about as far as shielding our learners so that they can learn. So these interruptions happen, and so our job was to pivot and try to be flexible ourselves with what can we offer to meet these goals and needs within these boundaries that are now more oppressive for all of us while still ensuring your safety. So I think that the, the COVID pandemic, you know, uh, necessity is the mother of invention. Many of us had to uh, adjust. Our, we had a resident who was supposed to be on a global health rotation who ended up flexing into our rural, rural experience. And that allowed her the opportunity to still have um, an opportunity to experience more austere care albeit in, a, in the United States at a known site with people we knew who are in a neighboring state. So I think how we, we have to internalize what people want and within the boundaries and limitations that are set up either by our institutions, by a pandemic, all, all you know, and, and, and. Our job is to try to manage the interruptions that happen. And that includes things like, um, I had a, child, a resident who basically gave birth early and that sort of completely disrupted her career development pathway. And then we had to figure out and sit down and talk about how we can help support this person who's now got a premature infant. So, you, I mean, you know, and, and to be fair, your goals change quite a lot when you suddenly have a medical issue like this. So that allows us to pivot based on our learners' needs, desires, and goals. I cannot agree enough with everything you just said. And I think one of the things we're starting to learn, especially with the pandemic and everything else, is there has got to be a backup plan. And we, should, we probably should have instituted that much earlier, especially with global health and more austere environments. But for folks who don't have the standard, hey, I'm gonna be on, you know, on campus kind of doing a more traditional thing. If something were to change and you can't go to Costa Rica and teach about snake bites while you're surfing, um, what is the next plan? What is the backup? And just giving everybody a little bit more confidence and agency to then pivot, which is something I think all of us probably need to put a lot more into with, uh, after going through COVID. I think the other thing that is very pertinent to COVID specifically is that we 
recognize that these electives are an important part of our curriculum and they were not just fluff to get rid of to staff the ED or staff the ICU. So I understand that we need to be flexible, like the situation in New York in particular was horrific at the start of the pandemic, but if you do have to remove that elective time, I think you owe it to the residents to be able to replace it back when things are relaxed. So that it's, it's not just the, the throwaway time to say, well, we can just pull you back from this at any time when we have service needs. We actually did not, we were very clear that we were not gonna get rid of our elective time during the COVID pandemic because our residents needed that break. It also offered us an opportunity to be creative and I think that was something that, and rely on our institution, I had a resident that was supposed to go to London and do part of palliative care time at Chelsea Westminster Hospital. We'd done all the paperwork, which British people love paperwork apparently, the Imperial <laughs> College, it was crazy. But all of a sudden she couldn't go to London. And I was like, well, where do you, where do you not feel, and this is her fast year, where, where, what are you worried about when you're gonna be in attending? My procedures. Oh, well, let's get you on the procedure team. It had nothing to do with her fast, but she got to do a couple of weeks of procedure team and had a lot of fun and did stuff. And so we just kind of flexed to figure out what worked for her. It wasn't ideal. She probably would rather have been in London, but she still had a good time. Uh, and we can skip ahead to any questions about what we've talked about so far, things in your own program that have, uh, that have come up. For challenges. Okay, we power on. Um, so finances are very interesting, and if you have not uh, dealt with electives, you probably don't push, appreciate um, that we are trapped in this room. It's the end of the conference, everything is just falling apart. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> um, the GME side of things, I did not appreciate until until we formed this panel, uh, is incredibly uh, diverse in, in from institution to institution in how they reimburse and their willingness to reimburse electives. And this is incredibly valuable time, obviously, to GME as these residents are continuing to get paid. So what pearls uh, and pitfalls do you have about the GME uh, reimbursement? So if you know how one institution's GME works financially, you know how one institution's GME works institutionally. You'll go to all these lectures and you'll be like, okay, there's IME, there's GME finance, there's these things, there's all these things. But most hospitals, many hospitals are over the cap. The way things are funded are often through departmental sources, school medicine sources. There's a lot of um, sources of income that come into how, how, how your budget works as a, as a, as a GME leader. On top of it, where your money can go is limited by your institution, and how that the, the ramifications look. So there, um, my institution, we pay, our GME basically accounts for where the residents are for four hour blocks, and they have to be on site in a clinical space and things like that. It's very, very micromanaged because of the CMS funding piece of it, and it's that federal funding which have, we are all accountable for. So going off to Costa Rica is not really an option for my residents um, as a general rule. Um, but I think one of the things that's really important when we talk about being flexible and all these other things is we have to be transparent. Uh, and, and so a, a, a lot of transparency about our residents, about how our funding works, what those options are, and allowing them to understand like, here, here are the boundaries, and yet, like, we are also, like, here's some of the options so that they can get an idea. You don't want to tamper down somebody's creativity, but you do want them to be realistic about, you, you've got to be realistic about money. It just doesn't come from nowhere. So I come from an institution that I think for some reason, I've never really understood there is some thought process that we have funding. I don't know if it's because we have an endowment. My residents are quickly learn that we don't have a money tree that grows in the back that we can just pull dollars off of and send them around even though we're Johns Hopkins. I'm like, no. They also have the added unbenefit, I say unbenefit because I'm not always a benefit of, I trained at Kings County in New York, which was an HHC program and in our resident office was a trailer in the back that didn't have heating and I could see the parking lot between the cracks and the floor. And so, you know, I went to my residency in the snow with my shoes off 
compared to them. So when they are like, well, why can't you fund me for this and fund me for that? I'm like, are you kidding? What? what? So, you know, there is also that balance of being very reasonable that, you know, we want to do everything for you, but we still have to be financially responsible. And messaging that, as you say, signposting, actually very early that we even tell our interns in our second years, when they talk about their fast year, it'll have to be within reason. You know, you're going to have to think about these things that, you know, what is the most valuable to you and what is not the most valuable to you. Yeah, I think it, it's, if you frame it in a non-medicine context, it makes a lot more sense, right? If you said, you're gonna go take a job at, you know, a consulting company, and then you're gonna ask them for three or four months out of your career with them to pay for you to go work for a different company and make money for that other company. Right, like that's insane. Right, that just doesn't work from a financial aspect. But essentially, like that is what we are asking our GME offices to do when we send residents out to other institutions. Now, not everybody's gonna do a clinical elective that generates income. A lot of people are gonna go do teaching things or just stuff for their own education. But it is, it's a really weird space to be in. So I think that's also part of the signposting and saying, look, you know, Northwestern, for me, pays your salary, and we're now sending you somewhere else where Northwestern is getting no benefit from paying you that salary and your benefits and everything else that comes along with that. You owe it to them to make this very worthwhile for your career. So I think framing it like that, it hopefully will resonate with a lot of people as opposed to saying, well, I'm, I'm owed my elective. Like, obviously you have to pay for me to go do this really cool thing that I want to do. Um, and some of that comes with scheduling too. Uh, and this is a conundrum that I think we all face because uh, particularly with some of the terminal electives, our chief residents are a great example. I mean, they put, our chief residents do uh, morbidity and mortality, they do scheduling, uh, they um, do administrative, a lot of longitudinal tasks and they are given blocks of time to account for that task. Um, and so what, if any, uh, kind of longitudinal ways have you, have you been able to account for longitudinal uh, electives um, by either scheduling changes or alterations to your blocks? So we make it really clear how many shifts people do over the course of the year. And so it, it is a conversation with their mentor about whether, if, if somebody's doing an operations career development pathway and they're gonna allocate three months to this time, what we do is we basically, like, that's what the mentor says to them, is that you're gonna have to be at the stroke, uh, morbidity, mor uh, mortality, uh, you know, these are the meetings you have to make to every month. And that having a longitudinal career pathway makes a lot of sense for that person because it gives them ongoing mentorship and experience and exposure. Sometimes their mentor is like, no, you're gonna be doing a bench research elective, discrete months are just much more valuable because you're gonna have to be doing experiments and you need to learn how the, lab materials work and so having one month here when we are all gonna be in the lab and doing experiments and this other month when we're all gonna be here doing experiments is really valuable. So the way we have it scheduled is you can do either longitudinal or discrete months as long as people know that they're doing the same exact number of shifts. And we had some confusion on our residency early on when we, somebody somewhere said it was a buy down and, and that got people very confused and so I think being sort of very explicit. I think all of these things require explicit explicitness around what, here's how many shifts you're going to work, how you work them will be different based on your career development pathway and what your mentor's guidance is. And that is how we develop the block schedule. And then we have notes in the block schedule so that people know exactly that this is a person who is doing a longitudinal, two longitudinal months, three longitudinal months, four longitudinal months, one longitudinal month, so that it's very explicit, so if somebody else can, like, you know, why is why is so and so working twelve shifts and I'm working eighteen, and 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 transparency is really important, I think, across the board. The residents never count shifts and compare schedules. No. Ever. That just does not happen. Um, we're a little different because we uh, don't have longitudinal tracks. So in three years, you know, we have an elective as a two and as a three, and so for us, the biggest scheduling issue becomes. You know, if you want to do a fellowship or whatever your career goal is, where can we best position the selective throughout the year to make sure that you can accumulate the experience, the, the mentorship, or 
whatever else it is to get your application and get yourself where you need to be successful. And so it, it, it takes a, we have to fast track that, so to speak, for our group. And again, it's all about mentorship. It's all about continuing to reach out, chat with folks and saying, hey, we need to have this conversation and let it evolve. And that's fine, but we have to do so with a great deal of frequency. I think over time, with a lot of um, missteps here and there, of course, um, we kind of get on a good rotation. We're like, okay, if you're interested in ultrasound fellowship and you know that early, like towards the end of your first year or early second year, we know where to position the rest of your selectives in order to make sure we maximize that time for you to put you in the best um, seat to succeed. I think it's actually very important. We've actually had to shift our block schedule because for our residents who are applying to critical care, they do need that elective. So they have an elective their third year before the long track begins their fourth year. And we have to make sure they get that critical care elective in before the application season because it's a year and a half, it's two years before. So they're not applying for critical care their fourth year, they're applying their third year. So we really had a flex to that. And speaking what you guys do at University of Washington is the fourth years know they have X amount of clinical hours, they have to work a year. And now since the system is so entrenched, they understand that sometimes they'll be working a lot and other people won't be, but they know later on those people will be working the shifts. So we do have very good transparency that everyone will work this amount of hours this year and you may work 20 shifts a month, hopefully not, but they will do three months in the ICU, the critical care people, and they, everyone knows that they'll be stacked. You know, so it just, or people do global health, they're gonna be gone, but they'll work their shifts later. And their fourth years are so adjusted to this now, and the junior residents see this happening, that it's luckily become now so normal that no one asks. But they did in the beginning. Um, and then accountability uh, is really a key to electives. Um, I think uh, to the GME side, um, how, how do you maintain accountability? I will quickly tell our system, so we have, uh, an administrator whose job it is to um, reach out to them ahead of time. It is a uh, editable Google Doc that they can then fill out their objectives, send it to their mentor, mentor can sign off on it, and then it is written in stone so that everyone can see and it is transparent and therefore uneditable um, that that is done. And it defines an end product in it. Uh, and then we reach out afterwards to both get feedback on the mentor, the experience, and uh, culminate in the the end product. Um, and I help run Taming the Shrew, which is uh, like a FOMED uh, blog, which is a wonderful outlet. Um, so if someone went on an away rotation or they were off service and they need a terminal project, that is just giving us evidence uh, and, and, and articles that we can use on the site and use it as an alternative uh, um, mentoring strategy. Um, so it kind of benefits, benefits us both. So that's what we use for a lot of the electives that don't have a clear definitive endpoint. We have a lot of discrete career development pathways. So the mentors have developed a checklist. So you know when you walk into it or before you're, as you're considering it, like these are the things that I will deliver. These are the things I will complete in order to get the certificate and to complete this experience. We also do a Google Doc that's shared across the PDs. It's part of our semi-annual process. And so one of the things that's really helpful is you know, and it's, it, we include their scholarship, their track, their mentors, and that gives us the opportunity for any, we do our counseling longitudinally. So I have three first years, three second years, three third years, three fourth years, and we divide them by four because there's four of us. And that way, if somebody were to ask any of the PDs, who's on this pathway, who's on that pathway, I can just go to that Google Doc, who has these interests, who's being mentored by X person, and any one of the PDs can go to that document, see who's mentoring them, who hasn't selected a pathway, who hasn't, where are people's interests for the first years and second years, what have they identified as desires and thoughts so that we've already kind of tapped into those things so when opportunities come, we can tap them. So the accountability piece is actually really important and I would say it's accountability and coordination. Just like you said, you wanna know what the mentor experience was for the resident, you wanna know what the, uh, who the resident is accountable to it allows you, and it also allows us to check it off. So have they completed the requirements of this thing? And then it allows us to check them off on that document so that we know, and our administrators all know that when they're producing their documents and their, you know, all of the things that we do, that they are, they are ready for that next step to proceed to graduation and all the rest of it. Any other ways about accountability? Because I think one of the things we're always struggling with is how do we create systems of accountability? 
um, it's hard to coordinate lots of residents and make sure that we're on top of all the things. Yeah, I mean, from a strictly uh, tracking standpoint, we do have a form when residents are going to be proposing their elective that <clears throat> goes through and actually has them list what the objectives of their elective are gonna be because it's not gonna be educational if they don't have objectives that they're trying to achieve. And there's a lot of templates for things that people do a lot of, whether it's you know a talks rotation or a reading elective and those sort of things. But if they're gonna go and blaze their own trail, they're gonna have to write some objectives. Um, they have to figure out who their, their mentor is gonna be. And then depending on whether it's a clinical versus a non-clinical and whether it's in-house or out, there are different deadlines before their elective starts. So that's, that's kind of our system for the accountability is to get stuff settled up front. And then we're a little bit less rigorous on the end product. Um, there's some trust there. But I do think, as we were discussing setting up for this elective, there's accountability in the other direction as well, right? Like we are very accountable to our residents to make sure that they are having an educational experience, to make sure that they're safe to make sure that all of these things are in place for them to be able to grow safely. And so I think that that's the other part that you have to be aware of. Like, we always complain, well, the residents, you know, they go, they do their elective, they don't have anything to show for it. Yeah, that's one half of the accountability. But also we have to be there saying, well, you don't have objectives. Let me help you set them up so that you can be successful and achieve the education that you want out of this experience. And I think, and we were talking about this as well, getting on the front end of this, because right now, obviously, That's another benefit of, of getting us together. It's just yeah. realizing the defense of electives. I think it was it was very present in COVID when we needed extra staffing, uh, and we offered another backup shift, but did not give up uh, electives because it is an integral part of the resonance that we are trying to um, produce. Um, and so part of this is to show you that there is work behind the scenes. It is incumbent upon all of us to to continue to tweak our systems, talk to each other, and exchange uh, as much as we can about electives because we're all fighting the same battle in relatively uh, similar but unique ways and can benefit from each other, um, which is why we certainly found this productive, I think, uh, and, and, and included too. Um, which brings us to our, um, our take home points, which are every GME is different, Know your rules and the ways that you can maximize uh, your flexibility within GME. Create a system of accountability that is bi-directional and then really facilitating, uh, curating and cultivating uh, a, a cache of mentors uh, that you trust and that trust you. And it really does benefit them, uh, hopefully as much as it does the, the resident. Um, so that's all that we had planned. Um, if you guys have questions, we're happy to stick around. Thank you for staying. Thank you for staying. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for staying. Yeah. The last day, the last hour. Yes, you guys did good. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Our inner secrets. Yes, understood. It said we had to request access. Yeah, that's me. run by our admin team but we have to tell a resident like what do you want to do patient safety QI operations like what person do we match you to and that person tries to integrate them into like a project they're doing and they sit down and say this is what I'm doing what are you interested in and we actually have the added benefit that our CMO is an is EM and he's great Dr. Hill and if it's if we can use that and flex them and then we have like a schedule like you're going to go to these sorry these operational meetings you're going to go work on this project but it, it does take that but our admin team we're very lucky is very engaged and there's an admin fast so they're very engaged and this is also a nice amount of luck does it brings it brings your mentors into the fold as far as wanting to be there for your resident so that's how we do it but it's one of the things we have to do early 
so that they know what they're going to do. They can't just go sit in on meetings and say, well, this is really fun, and then be done. You know. I said, do you want to say something, Logan? He's, a, <laughs> he's, my, he's my other APD. Oh, I, I have a question. Oh, okay. oh I, I was just going to say for my admin, uh, I'm very lucky. I have an ex-chief resident who went on to do an administrative fellowship and came back. And he actually runs uh, and is actually creating, so we have a number of residents who are on administrative pathways, um, but we're actually structuring it. So anybody who wants to do this more than a few times, we have very, very structured pathways with there's some flexibilities built in. You can do this or this or this or this. Um, and uh, right now they're working on that structure. But essentially that person runs that along with our QI folks. And so we have one resident right now who's working on an ortho EM uh, work group and actually they have a chief resident on their service and they are identifying their meeting once a month to identify issues that come up between the ortho and ED department. Um, and that's one of the longitudinal projects. So there's a, it depends on, uh, on, you know, we're just lucky that we have people with expertise who are heavily invested in the resident success. But I think there's lots of ways you could do it depending on the human resources, which is why like we're talking about tapping the network for people who are invested. You had a, thought, a question, thought? Uh, just a question about sort of the back-end accountability piece. Um, I teach one of the like fairly flexible like EKG rotations. So mm. um, essentially it's an advanced EKG rotation. I expect them to show up prepared and do three hours of one-on-one -on -one teaching and then I ask them to have a talk that they prepare that they're ready for. Uh, and essentially that back-end piece, residents never If the residents don't complete the requirements, I don't sign off on them taking the boards. That is a requirement <laughs> of the residency. This is, this, is, this is an investment. This is an investment. You're putting a lot of time and effort. This is an investment in them. We talked about, like, the reason that we do electives is because our residents are between education and workforce. And we protected those electives because it's so important to their education. We have all made arguments that this is critical to their education. Because this is what they chose to do it, as one of their deliverables, if they don't meet the deliverables, just like if they don't meet the scholarship requirement or the QI requirement or whatever other requirements are part of the residency program, they may have finished all the clinical, we will not sign off. That's why we keep that whole Google sheet. We take it pretty seriously. I mean, I have, we, I have not signed off on residents taking, you know, until they've completed those things, and that includes you know, conference, right? So resident might be a conference after graduation in order to meet their conference Even requirements. <laughs> but I mean, all of us, like you, none of us like to be the hard, a stick is not the way to work, but that is the outcome, just like if you don't do your job, you're not doing your job. These are set up outcomes, and so that's that's my response. Yeah. We, because um, along a similar thing, we, we kind of say now that Electives and selectives are not 100% guaranteed. They still have to be earned, and it's a part of that professionalism. So if you're not showing up to conferences or there are professional issues, you might not be granted that month. And for our threes, if you, to earn that third year elective, you have to complete your second year selective and have those deliverables. So again, you never, I mean, we don't want to be punitive, so to speak, but yeah. to a certain degree, and with signposting, that's what's needed, because this is still a professional setting. So. Thankfully, we haven't had to uh, go down that path with anybody yet. But. Uh, I'll speak to the culture point. When I took it over, that was the standard was just like, it, if you do not follow up on it, it will fall into the abyss, even if you do follow up on it, uh, which is why I think uh, a, a system and a culture is developed over several years. Um, and it definitely takes some, uh, some, some kind of strong, strong handedness at semi-annual reviews. Um, and my PD knows that I don't reach out very often. And if I do and it needs to come up, then it needs to come up. Um, but over the course of four years since I've been doing this, the intentionality pre and post electives, every six months telling them what to still do and see seeing the uh, program director. And eventually it gets brought up enough times uh, that, that people end up coming around. 
And it's also about setting those expectations at the beginning, right? Like, if they don't think that they're going to reasonably be able to deliver a talk, like, maybe that's not the right deliverable for their elective, right? Maybe you need a checklist to assess their performance on reading the EKGs as you're going through it, or maybe there's something else that they need to do. They're going to do an extra shift where they're just the doc in triage and they're signing off on every single EKG so the rest of us don't have to worry about it, you know? So I, I think that there is some, some creativity around that because some people are just, they're not going to be giving talks. They're not going to be academicians. They're not going to be educators. They have no interest in wanting to do that. Maybe they can have a different deliverable that is going to be more successful for them to achieve. I think that's about flexibility too. Yeah. Like those are the upfront things. So like we often are, right, like deliverables are often like somewhat negotiable of like you could use X, Y, or Z. So if it turns out that somebody's just really, like maybe the problem is that they are terrified of public speaking or whatever, and so that's the big barrier. It's helpful to maybe create a couple of other options and it's probably worth talking to folks about what, what is the barrier for you completing this thing? Is there something that's more in line with your passion that would be a, an equal win-win? Because you have created that one deliverable, maybe you could actually expand some of those deliverables. I don't know. It, and, and still actually, you know, maybe they could expand your library. Maybe they could, I mean, there's a couple other ways to do that. So I, I totally agree with Abra. I mean, like, I would say like the not signing off, it's kind of the end, it's like the very, very terminal sort of like, that's not the ideal. The ideal is that we get out all the people for a long time as much as possible. So I think that, I, I think that's brilliant. And that's part of that flexibility in sort of setting up something and it being intentional because you set it up early enough in advance that they're not set up to fail. I love that idea. Like we, we need a deliverable, here's our five options. Yep. Or if you think of a sixth one that is equally appropriate, let's add that and we can then add it for the future, for the future residents. But yeah, I can get where someone's like, I'd much rather sit down with an attending during a shift and sign EKGs, which is still an intentional learning process than do a talk, right? Or I will sit down and go with the junior residents or I'll sit with the intern and go through the EKGs, like, you know, um, which really would be helpful. <laughs> Awesome. Any other thoughts, questions, concerns? I know people have to catch their flight. So I know, I know. I'm like, I'm. Yeah. Everybody's <laughs> like, eh, what's up? Yes. Yeah, so, uh,